Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my big brother, Pastor Morgan Roders. What's up, guys? So today we have a very special guest, and we will be talking about waiting, which no one likes to wait. But we'll be talking about biblically what it means to wait and not just waiting and staying still and doing nothing, but serving others, serving the Lord, fearing God, loving him, obey his commandments, and all the in-between. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Tim Brown. Tim, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Well, Morgan, would you like to pray for us before we get started? Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time, and thank you uh, that we get to have uh, this time with Tim. And I just pray that you would bless it, God, uh, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, uh, that we don't want to just, um, just talk and just be about ourselves just to uh, build our kingdoms, but we want these testimonies and these stories to, to bless your heart and to bless your church and to bless those coming to know you. And so I just thank you uh, for Tim's testimony and that we get to take a look at that today and see what you have done, what you have uh, brought him through, and even what he's still waiting on. And so I just pray, God, that as we learn about the waiting and how that's a good thing, I pray, Father, that we would truly understand that and and be able to trust in you uh, even during the fiery trials. And so I just thank you, God, and I pray that you would uh, bless Tim's ministry and that you'll encourage him to keep going strong and, uh, like like he was saying in a message, to keep walking, that he'll keep moving and that he'll actively wait and that you'll show us as we have, there's so many seasons in life and we're all waiting for something. Show us how to do that in a biblical way, in a way that honors and pleases you. And thank you, God, that you're working on us even right now. And uh, I pray, God, that we would allow you to continue that great work that you're doing. And so we thank you and we give you this time. And it's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. So before we get into your testimony, could you just, for the listeners who don't know, you just share a little bit of who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, my name's Tim Brown. I live in, in Denver, Colorado, and I've been here my entire life. And uh, if you know anything about Denver, it's a very transient uh, city. It's changed a ton in the past decade. And so my uh, my claim up here is that I, I've been here since the beginning. Uh, I felt like, you know, 20 years ago it was a smaller city, but it's really blown up. Uh, but I'm 29 years old. I, I've, like I said, been here my whole life. And I actually, my my path into the ministry world is probably a little bit more unconventional than most. I, uh, I studied petroleum engineering at a science school here in Denver. Mm-hmm. And then I went to work uh, for an oil and gas company, but worked in corporate America for about seven years. Uh, and then kind of through that process, actually started to feel the tug of my heart from God to start. Uh, it really wasn't to actually go into ministry. It was really just to start making disciples and mm-hmm. take part in the Great Commission and, and just Jesus's commandment for all people, uh, everyday, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really intend to actually start a church. Uh, and I don't know if even my, my, my colleagues, we intended to start a church. Really. We just started making disciples Mm -hmm. and it sort of turned into a church. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's this moment, uh, it's funny. It was about a year ago where I'm in the middle of, you know, working two full-time jobs. I've got this sort of unconventional church, which really was just a group of people that were following Jesus Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of balancing that with the demands of a, of a very demanding corporate job. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the, the ministry that we had built and that God had given us was bigger than, uh, and more demanding than my job was. Mm -hmm. And so I actually made the decision to leave corporate America and, uh, started, uh, working for the Brook full time. And so that sort of leads me up to, to where I'm at today, um, establishing and and trying to lead a church. So that's awesome. Praise God. Yeah. So, with your upbringing, so you were born and raised in Denver then? Born and raised. Okay. So, what was your upbringing like? Were you in a Christian home or what did that look yeah. like? Yeah. So, I had um, an awesome mom and dad uh, who, who took my brother and I to church uh, most of our lives growing up. We went. To, we actually grew up in like a Lutheran denomination, mm-hmm. so it was a little bit more conservative. And uh, I think like most kids, I, I liked going to church, but I was kind of the distracted kid who would <laughs> draw pictures in the back. And uh, when I when I got into high school, I 
probably like most high school students do, I just started to uh, look to to other things, look to other things away from my faith. And uh, it, when I was 18 years old, I, I'll never forget, there was just this moment that I had where it really felt like I was experiencing some of the consequences of, of some decisions that I'd made while I was in high school that I think hurt myself and also hurt other people. Mm. And uh, it just really, I think, built this sense of meaninglessness. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was definitely not walking with God at the time, and I didn't feel like my life had purpose. I didn't feel like it had meaning. Mm. Uh, and then I transitioned from high school into a, um, I, w- I went to the Colorado School of Mines in Denver, which is a, a very, it's an engineering, it's a science school. And so mm-hmm. as I went into that environment at School of Mines, it was very atheistic, very agnostic, very science-based. And so I think the pressures of that environment coupled with uh, just even the brokenness that I was feeling as an individual uh, brought me to a pretty dark place very quickly mm-hmm. in my life. And uh, I remember it was my freshman year at School of Mines. I was walking on campus one day, and this guy walks up to me, and he says to me, he's like, hey, hey, is your name Tim? And I said, yes. And he said, hey, I've been praying for you. Huh. I was like, that's an, that's an odd, <laughs> odd thing to say to somebody that you've never met before. Yeah. And uh, he said, I'd like to invite you to my small group. And I, I remember asking him, I said, what's a small group? I don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. And he said, it's, it's just a group of guys that gets together and we talk about faith and community. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that just because of the position that I was in, uh, I said yes. And I really didn't want to go. And I think I actually ghosted him for a couple of weeks, like you know most 19-year-old guys do. <laughs> and then uh, one day I was, I was working out at the gym, uh, and he actually walks into the gym, the same guy's name is Billy. And he's like, hey, man, you know, you haven't shown up to the group in a, in a couple of weeks. I was wondering if you'd be willing to come. Hmm. And so very reluctantly, you know, I said yes, and I showed up. And I remember it was it was funny because I, I look back and I had all these questions. Like I had all these intellectual dilemmas mm-hmm. around the idea of faith. Um, it was just hard for me, especially as a person who was diving into science and engineering. I, I couldn't wrap my, my mind around the idea of this like all knowing, all powerful, mm-hmm. um, always present God. It just didn't make sense to me. Um, but it really wasn't through the getting those questions answered that I came to faith. It was through the community. Yeah. It was stepping into that small group of people and just being surrounded by seven or eight guys mm-hmm. who were so intentional in their relationships with me. Um, it was the first time that I'd ever been asked, I thought like deep, meaningful questions and experience like the love uh, that's that we see in Jesus that was shown to me. And uh, I just remember thinking, like leaving that group and thinking like, man, there's something different about those people. Mm. Like there's something different about them and whatever it is, I want that. And so I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep coming to this group. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a verse that I love in the book of John. And I think it's John seven seventeen. It says um, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether yeah. I speak my own. Amen. Jesus said, and so it just made me think about how throughout my story, I didn't always have all the answers. I didn't know exactly what the right thing to do was, mm-hmm. but I just showed up. Like I just showed up and I said, okay, I, I, I feel like I'm being gripped by the scriptures. I feel like I'm being gripped by this community of people and I'm going to lean into that. I'm going to say, okay, let, let's show up. And so I started going to a church um, when I was a freshman in college. It was called Red Rocks Church, which y'all have probably heard of. It's oh, a, yeah. a pretty big church in the Denver area. And Probably about six months later, it was in the back of a church service that uh, I, I raised my hand. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, had heard, I had heard for the first time in my life that following Jesus wasn't about a list of to-dos and mm-hmm. to-don'ts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was about a relationship, and that was just so transformational for me because I'd never heard that message before. Mm-hmm. And so I, I always say this, I was probably one of the most reluctant like Christian converts ever. <laughs> Uh, Because I had so many questions and I had so many dilemmas. Uh, But there's just this moment in the back of that church building where I raised my hand and I I said, yes, like I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I, I have sin in my life. Like I need redemption. I need the salvation that comes through a a relationship with Jesus. And uh, that really just, that's what kicked off the journey. So Mm. praise God. Yeah. And I I know that you talked about discipleship. Yeah. And uh, I think... I kind of wanted to talk about that because I believe it's very important. Mm -hmm. And I see churches kind of moving away from that. And Mm -hmm. church nowadays, um, it shouldn't be like this. But when people think, they think, I just go on Sunday and then leave and then live your life, you know. Mm -hmm. 
but what do you how do you it seems like you believe in the important importance of discipleship so mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about that absolutely yeah it's a it's a great question i think it's a tension that we are currently wrestling with in the american church yeah. And uh, I, I also see that God's Spirit, I think, is really starting to move in this area of discipleship because um, so much of what, what I think that we're experiencing, especially in the American church, is we've seen kind of the, 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 what, what's happened as a result of attractional Christianity, where it was more about the gathering than it was the scattering. Mm -hmm. And it seems like what's happening culturally, too, is there's sort of this like recalibration or this shift back to uh, the blueprint that we see for the church in the book of Acts, mm. um, which was really built around Jesus's great commission. And so, you know, with our church, with the Brook, you know, we, we, from, from day one, we said, okay, we want to go make disciples. Mm -hmm. And if we want to make disciples, we recognize that that means we probably have to do things maybe a little bit more mm -hmm. unconventionally than what the typical church is doing. And so, you know, we built our entire church around Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples we did too. <laughs> of all nations. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so you guys know it, right? Yeah. So yeah. we uh, we have like a vision that we, we cast to, uh, we call them simple churches, but th those are like our kind of, you could call them small groups, um, but there are discipleship groups where the entire focus is around the Great Commission. It's all about, yeah. okay, how can we bring people together in community and then go and make disciples, teach them uh, to obey the commandments yeah. of Jesus and baptize them. And, uh, you know, like one of the things I think has been transformational for us is, is like in the book of Acts, uh, the author talks about, he uses the language, ordinary unschooled men. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the biggest misconceptions out there that I see is that that commandment of Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach to obey his commandments, that is not a commandment to professional pastors. Mm. It's not a commandment to graduates of seminary school. It's a commandment to every single follower of Jesus. Yeah. And uh, that's what I love about our faith is we, you know, we, we go back to the scriptures and we see these guys like Peter and James and John, and you know, it, they, they're so relatable. Like mm. they're just making mistakes and uh, you know, they, they show all kinds of signs, I think, of, of character flaws that we all can relate to so well. Mm -hmm. But the, the important principle there is, is that Jesus chose them, and they, they were ordinary, unschooled mm -hmm. men and women who were following him. Yeah. And so I think when it comes to discipleship, like what we're trying to do is we're trying to get back to that model. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to get back to a place where we can uh, teach and train and equip young professional leaders um, people who have been walking and following Jesus for decades, people who just came to faith three months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's something that we talk a lot about called pace. And I don't know if you all have heard that term before, but the way that we define pace is pace is like if you drew out a timeline of a, of a Christian's journey. So they're, they're born, and then there's the first time that they hear about Jesus, and then there's the time that they come to faith. Mm -hmm. And then sometime between the time that they come to faith and the time that they actually go out and multiply that period of time is what we call pace. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to build into our culture is, um, you know, I was pretty broken by, I heard this stat that, uh, less than 2% of Christians, people who follow Jesus have ever shared their faith mm -hmm. less than 2%. Oh. Oh. And so, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of break through that barrier to entry to where we can shorten the pace or shorten the timeline mm -hmm. between when a person comes to faith and when they start actually multiplying and evangelizing. And, and the way that we, we try to accomplish that is just through, through training. It's, you know, it's taking the model that Jesus had where, you know, Jesus trained, uh, you know, he had a method for, for how he trained his disciples. But one of the things that I love about Jesus was he trained on the job. <laughs> and so he brought these 12 guys with him. He brought them everywhere that he went and he showed them. He said, this is how I share my faith. This is how yeah. um, I heal somebody. This is how I pray. And he used it as a model so mm -hmm. that he could then use those 12 people to go and radically change the world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, that's kind of how it's been for us. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And yeah, that's what we're trying to do because that was our uh, mission or vision or whatever you want to call it. But then we were realizing, hey, we need to get back to actually discipling. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, our, our church, like my dad, he teaches the tough things and mm -hmm. doesn't shy away from those things. But we need to also me make too, disciples. Mom. And Oh, me too. Thanks. Perfect. But 
like so people yeah as we're discipling people we want them to go and multiply it's not gonna it's you know it can be like that pace you said it could be a different time but at least you know sometimes it takes a year sometimes it's quicker but just i we like to disciple them for a year and then they can start discipling someone else you know mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be yeah. perfect like that but yeah that's the key to multiply and i think i've also seen where people go like hey you know we don't need we don't really need the church we just need these small groups but the church is so important too coming together and gathering and then the pastor is supposed to train equip and teach people so that they can go out and be those ministers you know and and it's not just about the pastor trying to save all these people but like mm -hmm. you said it's for everyone we're all supposed to yeah. you know fulfill the great commission so Amen. yeah and it's cool that you're saying that because i want to talk about how a lot of young adults they get confused when they hear because like the verse i'm gonna read it right now it says um in john 14 15 it says if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's hard for people to hear because they can just say like, oh, I love God. Like I read my Bible and do that. But then they read the word, but then they don't apply it to their life. Because like Morgan always says, you can disciple someone. We disciple like young adults and have people. And then we teach them these things. We even sometimes help them with like accountability things. But it usually isn't... Um, it isn't like an issue with sin. A lot of times it's usually a love issue. Like they don't, mm. they say they love God, but they don't really show it their actions because when you give them a scripture of, hey, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.22 to flee from anything that stimulates youthful lust. And for them, they're like, oh, well, I just think I can do this and do that. Or like when it talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, like fornicators, homosexuals, adulterers, swindlers, drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. And they get offended by that. And it's like, I just read what the Bible said. <laughs> so what would you say for that is like, how do you tell, it doesn't just have to be young adults, but people that like, it even says, I'm going to read this verse really quick. Sorry. John 13, 35, it says, um, your love for everyone will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So yeah. what does that mean to you? Like, how do we love God and do you agree with those? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I think that that I think you bring up a really important issue because that does seem to be a, a big disconnect. And I even look back on my own story where I just for so many years, I think I was captivated by the gospel of Jesus, but I had so much trouble um, putting his commandments into practice and and truly obeying. And you know, as I as I look back, I think. Like if I could go back and I could talk to myself as a 21 year old, mm -hmm. I, it, it reminds me of, uh, I think you guys will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's Galatians 5, 1, 5, 1, uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Mm -hmm. And I just think about how so much of Jesus's commands are not to hurt us, but they are to protect us. Amen. And they are to provide not only eternal life, like so often we think, okay, well, we think the gospel is, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus, and then I go to heaven forever. And then what happens kind of in between my birth and my death doesn't really matter all that much because mm -hmm. I am saved by grace. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesus didn't just promise eternal life. He also promised redemption today. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and the old is gone and the new has come. And so there's like, there seems to be this disconnect where, where people are making decisions to trust Jesus but we're not seeing the the new, like we're not seeing the old is gone and the new. And I think what that bridge is, is the bridge is obedience, yeah. mm. the obedience to, to take what Jesus said and to actually put it into practice. And, and I mean, you, Mariah, you said it so well that it starts with a foundation of love. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like if you summarize the entire, and Jesus did it, if you summarize the entire Old Testament scriptures, mm. it would be to love God and to love people mm. with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Yeah. And if you could summarize, I think, the entire New Testament, it would be what we just talked about, the Great Commission. Mm. And so if we, can, if we can take those three things and put them together and we can love God with all of our, our, our mind, soul, and strength, we can love people, we can be living witnesses to them, not just so that we're personally redeemed by God, but so that we can be a living witness and epistle mm -hmm. to see our other uh, friends, family, coworkers come to faith. 
And then we can take that, that beautiful treasure that we have and go out and share it with others and make disciples. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that's how we see a transformed world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think like getting more practical when it comes to actually putting Jesus's uh, commands into practice, mm-hmm. I always like, I, I think of it, it's almost like a, uh, it's like working out, right? Like mm-hmm. fitness, you know, you go to the gym and I think sometimes the church, we can be in a position where it's like we show up to the gym, but we don't ever work out yeah. and we wonder why we don't see results, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like I got the, I got the, I got the membership, <laughs> I got the 24 membership and I show up and nothing's happening and I don't understand why. Uh, but it's not until you actually get on a piece of equipment and you start running or you start exercising that you you see the fruit of of uh, your labor. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it just reminds me too that like I think that as young people we need to become more comfortable with the idea of acting our way into feeling and not feeling our way into acting oh, that's mm-hmm. good. because so much of what we do is driven by our emotions yeah. and our feelings mm-hmm. and. Uh, just to shoot everyone straight, there's going to be a lot of days, as you uh, as you very well know, where you're going to wake up in the morning and you are not going to feel like following Jesus, yeah. and you're not going to feel like obeying His commandments. And there's going to be temptations, and there's going to be other things, other apples that are going to be so shiny and so attractive. And uh, it takes that internal resolve, that devotion, to say, you know what, I'm not going to. I know my feelings are, are, are different, you know, in a different place right now, but I'm going to act my way mm-hmm. into feeling like I'm going to put my butt in the seat. I'm going to open the word. I'm going to talk to Jesus and I'm going to expect in faith that he's going to meet me where I'm at. Yep. Amen. Yeah. yeah, I was taught on that. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's not my phrase, but fact, faith, feeling, right? Feelings the fact, the, the mm-hmm. truth of God's word, you put your faith in that. And you're talking about that and uh, the message I watch. Uh, which you're talking about God's promises yeah. that when you weren't feeling it, weren't you didn't, you know, you weren't believing at that time. You just r- got in the Word and you saw His promises and just let those uh, rush over you. And I think I would like to transition into into that waiting period and why you had a message on waiting. And if you want to talk about that season in your life, and I know that we're all waiting for something, so. Yeah, do you want to talk about that right now, the waiting part? Absolutely. Yeah, you you said it really well that that uh, we're all waiting for something, and if we're not waiting right now, just just give it some time because <laughs> yeah. we'll be there we'll be there soon enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess I would start just by saying I think that biblically, like it helps to start with this foundation is uh, in Isaiah fifty five. Uh, mm-hmm. God is talking to the pro- prophet Isaiah, and he says he says for My thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, Mm. declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, Mm. and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I think it's so important for us to recognize that as long as we survey God, who doesn't think the way that we think, and who doesn't act the way that we act, we are guaranteed to experience confusion in this life. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if, you know, I at the risk of being a heretic, if I could add to that verse, uh, you know, I'll kind of be a Eugene Peterson for a moment. <laughs> I think what God would probably say, so is my timetable, not your timetable. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just because it's so hard for us to, uh, to, I think, resonate with God's timing versus our timing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, so when I was 20, I'm 29 now, when I was 24 years old, I was engaged to get married and uh, was in a relationship for about a year, uh, had proposed, uh, we were both going to church together. We'd actually both been baptized together. And um, we're doing our best to follow Jesus, but mm-hmm. certainly uh, I think had some red flags in the relationship that we ignored. Mm-hmm. And when we were a few months away from the wedding, uh, the the entire engagement just blew up. And, uh, and I, was, I was down in Louisiana. I was attending a friend's wedding. And uh, we were like walking back to the hotel where our whole group of friends was staying. And I was with my, my fiance at the time. And as we were walking through the hallway, she had just, she looked at me and she took her ring off and, and gave it to me and just said, I, I just can't do this. Like, I, I don't love wow. you. And, uh, I just remember at the time just being totally devastated, mm-hmm. uh, like complete shock. Uh, I, and I think as I look back to so much of that shock just came from thinking about, you know, sort of what does the future look like? What does my future family look like? What does my future relationships look like? And then kind of seeing that vision for my future just completely torn down in, what felt like a moment, just a, a few seconds. Mm-hmm. And uh, it really just launched me into a period of time and a season of life where 
uh, I think God was doing a very deep work in my soul and was uh, forcing me to wait uh, not only on my relationships and my future spouse because I'm single, so I'm still not married. And so I, I'd say I'm still kind of in a period of time of waiting, mm-hmm. uh, but also just waiting on him uh, to reveal his plan and his purpose for me. And um, and so I guess I'll just start by saying that if there's anybody who's listening right now that is in a season of waiting, I just I want to affirm that it's hard. <laughs> it's really difficult. It's really difficult. But I also believe that there is just something about the uh, – the trials that come with waiting that open the door as a catalyst for God to do a special work in our lives that he just, it it just, it, there's no other mechanism that I, that I know of that will enable that type of growth and change to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember when, when I was going through that breakup of five, six years ago, I was so devastated and so broken that it didn't help to talk to people. Uh, It didn't help to see a counselor. The only thing the only place that I found peace was in God's word. Mm -hmm. And just every single day, I remember waking up in the mornings and I would go to work and it just felt like I would put one foot in front of the other. (laughs) And uh, it felt like that black cloud just followed me around everywhere that I went. And I would open up God's word before I'd go to work and I would just read page after page after page. Mm -hmm. I would close it. I would write verses on sticky notes. I'd put them in my pocket. And then at work just throughout the day, I'm just looking at the sticky notes all day, just reminding myself of God's truth, speaking it over my life. And then I'd come home and sit down at my kitchen table and just read page after page after page. Mm. And I did that for a week and a week turned into a month, a month turned into six months, six months turned into a year and a year turned into a couple of years. Mm. And all of a sudden I looked back and I realized that I was a completely different person, like completely different person. And I think it just speaks to the power of God's word. And, you know, even just one of the staple verses for my life is John 15, five. Um, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Mm-hmm. If you remain in me, you, you will bear much fruit mm-hmm. apart from you, nothing. Yeah. And I, it just reminds me too, of just how, I think when Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I think he meant that literally that apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And it's so true because I've tried to like force things and do things in my own strength. And that, happened to me I was when I was well, two years ago three years ago 21 and I the guy I was with he had the ring we we're supposed to get engaged and everything and but I knew deep down that it was wrong like I knew that he was like a good old boy who said he loved God like and all these things but I knew we didn't have the same calling too like I knew I wanted to be in ministry I wanted to like be like like be able to minister to women and stuff like that and he, no offense to engineering, but he actually went to school of mines. Like he was an engineer and just was very like, everything for him was like work, work, work. And I was like, that's great. But, and you love God, but he really didn't really want to go to church all the time and stuff like that. So I saw the flags, but as girls, you always try to like brush over those things. Hmm. You're like, oh, I want the wedding. I want the marriage and everything and all the kids and the house. But it wasn't until my dad who he was like very discerning and he was like, this guy doesn't, he's not going to be able to lead you, Mariah. And so I was so mad. It broke off. And then, like you said, the same thing. Like I tried to do everything else, like talk to people and all this stuff. But all I could do was like read the scriptures. And it wasn't until I actually read the Psalms that I started to realize, I was like, oh my goodness, like this actually is real for me. Like before I would read Mm -hmm. about like having enemies and stuff. And I was like, oh, everyone likes me. I'm like, awesome and so prideful but until I started realizing like they're starting to say things that aren't true and I want to defend myself and I was like okay well with everything like all we can do is just like seek first the kingdom that's why we love the verse Matthew six thirty three, yeah. and mm-hmm. live righteously and same thing I thought like okay well then I could get and I started trying to force things like well I want to be in a relationship like I want to get this over with like I hate being single but I think what I learned from all of it, and my brother has really helped me with all of it. He's like, Mariah, you're not single because I was in the season where I'm like, I'm going to be single forever. (laughs) I don't care. Like, I don't want to get married. And Morgan told me one day when he asked me to make him a sandwich, and I said no. (laughs) And he said, Mariah, you're not single. You're selfish. And that hit me, and I was so convicted because I was like, man, that's so true. Like, I, even when I was in my other relationships, like, I just wanted what I wanted. I just wanted 
to have the perfect life and family and things like that. And I wanted him to understand, like, I wanted to be in ministry. But, like, when you're in a relationship or anything, you have to serve them. And so that's what I want to talk about is, like, serving because all of Mm -hmm. us get, like, so caught up in, like, the next season and, like, what to do and how to get there. And, like, if I'm only content, then God will do it because I've heard it in all the other stories, like, when people are content. But it isn't until you can actually just be reading the Bible, right, reading the Word of God Mm -hmm. and then living that out. And then also just asking the Holy Spirit, like, Holy Spirit, speak to me today. Like, what do you want me to do? I want to hear your still small voice and then obey. And just living that life is so much more fulfilling than trying to seek after a relationship Hmm. or something like that because it's so empty. So can you talk about, like, serving and what that looks like and why that's important, like, in the waiting season? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's. I love the word serving. Uh, I think that there's a word that we, we talk a lot about in, in our faith and it's the word stewardship. Yeah. Hmm. And a lot of times if, if you're like me, when you think of stewardship, your mind probably first goes to like money to finances. Mm-hmm. And hmm. uh, just because I, you know, Jesus talked about money so often and, and he, I think he really wanted to push us to be wise stewards of money, just probably because he knew the power that it has in our lives. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but I also think of stewardship of time and especially like for for all the single people that are out there uh, and also for those who are married and who have kids there's just this reality that exists when you are a single person where you have time that is available Mm -hmm. uh, that you just don't have when you're married and you have kids and i think that my that perspective shift came for me in the last couple of years when a lot of the people that uh, are in my circle started to actually become married and have kids and i just realized how constrained they were Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it, what it makes me think about, though, is, is I think one of the beauties of being single is it's a, it, it, the time that we have is a gift. Mm-hmm. It is a gift to be stewarded. And really, like, this is something that I think has just been transformational in, in the past couple of years is embracing a season of singleness, embracing that time to say, okay, God, I do have this extra time. Like mm-hmm. I can be working a full-time job and I can be going out and meeting with guys mm-hmm. and leading them and making disciples and teaching them and training them and equipping them mm-hmm. to go out and share their faith. Um, when I know that someday if I'm married and I have kids that I won't be able to do those things. Mm-hmm. And so I think serving, I mean, serving is a huge part of that. Um, you know, my, my life started to change when I started serving. It's funny when I was going to Red Rocks about five or six years ago, uh, that was the place where I, I, I was an usher. So I was like the guy with the walkie talkie mm-hmm. in the ear and I was helping people get seated. And I had a little clipboard that I walked around with and wore this like really kind of funny oversized red polo. Mm-hmm. And my job was I would help people get seated and then I would pick up trash after the service mm-hmm. and I'd take all the trash out to the dumpster. And during that time, I remember thinking to myself like, man, this really doesn't feel significant. This doesn't feel like what God has called me to do or, you know, these dreams that he had. But I just, that Jesus's words kept running through my head of if, if I can trust you with a little Tim, I can trust you with much. Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm like, all right, God, if you, if you can just, if I can be faithful with taking the trash out mm-hmm. uh, every single Sunday, then, then I think that, that you'll trust me with, with your people and you'll trust me to fish for your people mm-hmm. and to disciple your people. And, I'm still in the process and I'm still growing and I definitely don't have this life figured out. Uh, you know, I'm growing just like everybody else mm-hmm. is, but I can tell you that God time and time again, he has met me where I was at and he has been faithful every single time. It just makes me think about like, I think that the world's economy is built on this idea of uh, if I give to you guys, I become poor and you become rich. Mm-hmm. But, but God's economy is so much different. God's economy is I get, I get from God I give to you and then God gives me more so that he he trusts me with more Mm -hmm. so that I can make you more rich. Mm -hmm. And it's that, I think that it's true with serving too, is like when we can take the time to actually uh, utilize our God given gifts, our unique abilities Mm -hmm. um, to serve in the kingdom in whatever capacity that looks like uh, what what we actually do is, is, I mean, we we're there for the church. We're there for other people, but God does a work inside of us. Uh, And I think that, that, yeah, it just had such a transformational impact on my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's amazing how God tells us these things and to do these hard things because he knows it's what's best for us. And we think, God, that's not best for me. Like that example of you know, that picture of our will versus God's will. Yeah. We just think of a straight line to the finish line or 
out of you know Egypt you know to the promised land we think just a straight line but God takes us on a journey and uh yeah there's a I forgot how you said it but you said God's I think you said God's not so concerned about your destination but how you get there or like what you're becoming right how, how do you yeah. say it again yeah, so uh, G- God cares far more about who you are becoming than where you are going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's good. Yeah, and so, and between that, you know, that you know, the place you started and the destination, there's service, um, but there's also suffering sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I think a lot of people, when they're trying to make a convert or something, even though we can't save anyone, it's God, but when you're trying to, you know, preach the gospel, so I see people, they don't really mention anything about suffering or what you're going to endure. And you don't want to scare them, of course. You don't want to just say, yeah, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> but you need, you know, but you, a lot of people miss that part. So what do you think the importance of suffering and, you know, all those valleys and those twists and turns, what is that doing for us as Christians? So. Oh, it's, yeah, it's such a good question. I think that, mm. like, when we uh, when we look, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned the Exodus, you mentioned the Israelites coming out of Egypt, mm. and uh, there's there's this map that I, I actually have it hung on my wall, and I love to look at it because it shows a map of their journey. Yeah. And, you know, if you saw that map, what you would see is, is that, you know, God took them south and then north and west, and mm-hmm. they ran into an ocean, and then they went into, you know, a few different deserts and wildernesses, and then, you know, one of them, they just wandered in circles for... Mm-hmm. Uh, a long time. And like be, me being a math guy, I, I look at it and I'm like, you know, God, do you not know that, that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line? Like what, yeah. what's going on? And I think that, you know, there was so much divine purpose behind the Israelites journey. Mm. There was so much that God was doing in them so that later he could do a work through them. Mm-hmm. And it's just amazing how time and time again, he uses the vehicle of suffering. Like Look at Moses. I mean, Moses was arguably the single most important prophet in the Old Testament. Mm. And when he was 40 years old, the Bible says that he was, in Hebrews 11, he was such a profound man of faith that he forsook the pleasures of the palace, and he went to go be mistreated with his people. And you you think like, okay, after a faithful decision like that, God is like going to reward him. (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) what happens to him? I mean, he gets... Yeah. exiled right to the wilderness like <laughs> a thousand miles away from his family and friends and he becomes a sheep herder mm-hmm. and it's like oh my goodness B- but then the beauty of scripture is is that we get to see the whole story mm-hmm. and you look at Moses's life and you see that in order for God to prepare him to become what was arguably the single most important prophet in the Old Testament he had to take him to the, w- the wilderness where there was suffering where there was a, a breaking down of his identity where Moses could get so familiar with God and his word mm-hmm. and the discipline of prayer, that when the time actually came for Moses to lead 600,000 people out of slavery and into the promised land, that he wouldn't give up and quit. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because I, I think, it, like like you had said, is it is our character that is the foundation of our quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, God, God cares so much more about who we're becoming yeah. than where we're going. And I think he's a good dad. And, and what good dads do is, is, they don't put us in situations where they know that our our character isn't built to sustain us. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I say this all the time, but like if I think if God takes us from slavery to surplus in a day, and we don't have the character to sustain it, mm-hmm. that surplus will destroy us. Yeah. Like yep. it will, it will get the best of us every single time. And so He knows and He sees those situations. And so He's like, all right, I'm going to going to put you in some situations. I'm going to put you in some circumstances, in some relationships, even maybe a career or a job where Mm -hmm. there's going to be suffering, there's going to be persecution. Mm -hmm. And it's only in those times that God does that deep soul work that actually builds our character to sustain the quest that he has for us. Yeah. I think about that when we read the Bible, we can read it pretty quick, you know, Mm -hmm. and but you don't realize the the time in between all those stories. You know, we just go from chapter to chapter but we don't realize what 25 years between you know the promise and then yeah, yeah the son and I'm like I'm I just turned 26 it's like that's how I've been, <laughs> that's most of my life you know yeah. but we don't really we kind of pass by those things really quickly and we get to yeah. see the bigger picture which should help us to trust God 
but it's it's harder when you're you're in it and you don't see the bird's eye view yet but hopefully as we read the word of god we can see that god you know his promises are sure his promises are true and he's never going to leave us nor forsake us and it's even though it seems tough and like you said it is tough at times um we got to keep keep pursuing him and keep working hard for him and i like how you said that earlier about singleness because i was just talking to a friend uh, the other night and he was saying that he was saying i'm i'm starting to realize that singleness is a gift you know mm-hmm. and we got to learn how to be content wherever we are you know whether we're married or single because and and i think also building well yeah i was talking to him about how it would be better to be 40 and single you know or 30 and single or something than mm-hmm. to be 30 and divorced and you mm-hmm. see so yeah. many people like that nowadays and divorce is such a common thing and uh so yeah i think it's it's really encouraging what you said about that how we just need to make sure that we're content where we are and that we see every every place that God's put us in as a gift and that he's producing great things with us. He's removing the dross just like the goldsmith, you know, and so that he can yeah. see his reflection in us. So yeah. mm-hmm. do you have another great question? Word. Um, well, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the fear of God because mm. we were just talking about this on Wednesday. We're doing a study in the book of Daniel. Mm-hmm. And mm. I think that's also something that's really important because um, Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen it says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments or obey mm. his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. So I think there's a lot of young adults who are like, I don't know my calling. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like there's so many different things that I could do. But the thing that I think I was listening to one of this podcast with um i think it was becoming something and he was talking about you don't have to focus on oh should i do this or should i do that like if you are just fearing god and obeying his commandments like if you're just every day when you wake up you're just like okay god what do you want me to do and submitting to his will like not my will but your will be done then those little things that are not like scriptural like should i go to this school should i go to that school like i mean honestly you can't really like god is sovereign But sometimes, because here at Calvary, we believe that in the sovereignty of God. We also believe in the free will of man. We're not Calvinist or Arminiist. Like, but for us, like, we believe what the Bible says. And so we also, I love this verse. I'm sorry. I'm like saying all these. But Psalm Mm -hmm. 37, 3 and 4, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the Mm -hmm. land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But people just hear the verse, he'll give you the desires of your heart, but they don't delight themselves in the Lord. They're not like Mm. intimate with God where it talks about in Matthew 7, like, didn't we do this, God? But didn't I do this? Didn't I go to this school? Didn't I marry this person? But then he can say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that knowing in the Greek is gnoskos, which is intimacy, like a man knows his wife. Like we want to be intimate with a person and marry someone, but it's like, as it doesn't because like it's easier for women to understand it because they're like bride of christ but for guys i feel Mm. like that's hard because they're like wait that's weird i'm the bride of christ but to realize that if we are intimate with god and fearing him like the fear of god it really shows that we love him because every Mm. day you're just aware of his presence you're Mm. not aware of what i want to do or is this the person is that the person you're just so aware of what god's having you do And the only way we can do that in the way God speaks the clearest is in the word of God, like Mm -hmm. the most clear. So can you just share? Yeah. You can go. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask too, um, because you talked about waiting well. And I think uh, a lot of times when I deal with young adults, I'm still a young adult too, but (laughs) but I got got married two years ago. So sometimes people are like, hey, how did, uh, how did all this happen? But waiting well is a is a key thing because i see some people they think hey once i get married then my life will get started then my ministry will get started but it's like if you're thinking that then you're missing it you're supposed to be serving god now you're supposed to be ministering and doing the work of the ministry now and hopefully when you get married that will just multiply that ministry 
and yeah there's some there's some uh time restraints and stuff constraints and you have to you know give more attention to your spouse than you could give to other people but hopefully you can just fan that fire in your spouse to keep going for him and it shouldn't just be okay now we turn inward and look at ourselves and look at each other but it's like no we're on a we're on a mission together mm -hmm. so uh how do you encourage people because you've probably heard that too they they just are looking for marriage or something ahead and thinking that's when it will start but yeah. what do you tell people yeah. how to how to wait during that time yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the first thing, and, and even to Mariah, what you were saying earlier, is one of the biggest misconceptions that I think so many of us have, and I've been guilty of this too, mm -hmm. is this idea that our calling from God is out in the future. Yeah. And it's almost like this carrot that's dangled in front of our heads and we're always going after our calling. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you just moved to a new city and you just got a new career and maybe you're, you're dating a new person and you're like, okay, what am I called to do, God? Like, what am I called to do? And I think it's healthy to remember, even just to, to the verses that you all were just quoting, is where we are at is where we are called. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's, that, it's that daily step of faithful obedience. I mean, gosh, Scripture is just littered with, um, if you remain in me and I in you, mm -hmm. uh, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be given to you. John fifteen seven says, ask whatever you wish. If you remain in me and I in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Mm -hmm. But it's that, it's that predecessor, it's that, that preface that says, if you remain in me and I in you, mm -hmm. that we probably glance over and we just hear the ask whatever you wish and it will be given yeah. to you. And, and I think that, I mean, you, you mentioned like we have, you're single and then we have married. And so you guys are probably seeing, you know, kind of the full spectrum, but uh, I'm sure that you would say that once you get married, it's not like everything all of a sudden just transforms and changes and things become so clear. It's like, yeah. you know, the things that you struggled with before marriage are still true during marriage. And uh, I, I, I love, I mean, God gives us, I think the, the gift of marriage, because I think he just, he knows inherently that two people can go further together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's this beautiful bond that, that happens in marriage. And, and like you said, it reflects the uh, Christ in, in his bride, which is the church. Mm -hmm. um, but back to you, back to your question about just waiting well. Um, I, man, this has been a really hard one for me. I, I'll, I'll admit this, that I have not been, been perfect here because waiting is really tough. But yeah. I think the, the advice that I would give first is always wait with a promise. Mm -hmm. Always wait with a promise. And what I mean by that is, is that People can endure remarkable trials. Um, it is amazing the capacity that I think God gives us mm -hmm. when he created us to endure trials and suffering for the end goal of what it will do in our hearts and how it will change us. But it is so difficult to endure trials and waiting when we don't know what we're waiting for. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it's so important to just know what it is that we're actually waiting for. And, and that comes by getting into the word of God and knowing what his promises are. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the second piece of advice that I would just give is to wait actively. And, and we talked a little bit about that earlier, but um, you know, I love in, in the Israelites journey, you know, they're, they're going through the wilderness and they're going up and down and in circles, but the entire time they were walking, yeah. they were always walking. Yeah. And while they were walking, God was working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think probably for a lot of you know young adults, young professionals, people who are listening, what God's calling them to do is to get up and walk, yeah. mm -hmm. get up and, and, and yeah, put yeah, show up on Sunday, bring a mm -hmm. friend with you, uh, uh, put your head in, in some scriptures and start reading what God's promises are. Start serving at your church. Um, find some elders in your life and come under the authority of them. Yeah. Uh, find some true leaders and mentors in your life. And just start taking those faithful steps. I mean, for me, what that looked like was taking the trash out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's how I, I know it sounds so simple, but I was like, all right, I'm going to just, I'm going to show up on Sundays. I'm going to serve and I'm going to take the trash out. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll see God. I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you take that really small uh, act of faithfulness and I'll let you do something with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was through, it was through the, the relationships that I, that I developed during that time of serving that I ended up starting a church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and like, that's an example of, I think when Jesus talks about the faith of a mustard seed turning into like a full grown tree with, you know, branches and, and I just, I've seen how time and time again, he's multiplied those really small steps of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, w the, the last thing that I would say, I actually talked about this in, in that message too, but, mm -hmm. and this is the one that I struggle with the most is I, I call it waiting with an open hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I mean by that is that a lot of times we all have wishes. Like there are things that we wish for and there are things that we're hoping for and things that we're praying for. 
and we come to God with, you know, God, like, I just want to marry this person. Like, mm-hmm. like I, I'm in love. I want to marry this person. And we have a death grip on that wish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're like praying day and day and day out and just asking God to, to bring this, this promise of this wish to fruition. Mm-hmm. And what God, I think, wants to do sometimes is he wants us to let go. He wants yeah. us to come to him with that wish with an open hand mm-hmm. and say the most powerful words in the English language, which is not my will, but mm-hmm. your will be done. And what God will do is, and this is what he did in my life, is what he'll do is he, in his love and his grace and his infinite wisdom, he'll, he'll take that wish out of your hand mm-hmm. and he will replace it with something that is immeasurably more than all you at, could ask or imagine. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the God that we serve. Amen. 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 Hmm. And that's awesome that, well, you, even when you said take out the trash, my dad was just saying that hmm. the other day. He's like, guys, if you're like walking around the church and you see a piece of trash, pick it up. Like, it's not that hard, but there's yeah. something in us that's like, oh, someone else will do it. Mm. Or that's too lowly. Yeah. And it's like Jesus washed his disciples' feet, which was like the lowliest mm. job of servant. And that's if where you like the be best. the greatest, be yeah, a you servant have to of be all. the least. Yeah. And Amen. I think that we don't see that nowadays. Now you think like people are just trying to like be influencers on social media and like get w- rich quick and like <laughs> all this stuff. Instead of like you said that, if you are, the Bible says, like, if you're faithful with the little things, like, mm. he will, like, give you much. Like, he will bless you with more things if you're mm-hmm. faithful with the things that he has in front of you. And I think that's hard for people because, like, for me, I'm a control freak. I like to control things, and I will not watch a movie or read a book unless I know the ending, <laughs> which is awful. But that's why I love the Bible, because we know how it ends. Like, we mm. know what's going to happen. Yeah. And that's where First uh, John 3, 3, it says, everyone who has this hope, in Mm. him purifies himself just as christ Mm. is pure all who have this hope in him purify themselves oh it just repeated it on the thing but anyway (laughs) i think it's important because that hope that we have is in christ coming he's coming for his church he's coming for his bride like for us as calvary like we believe in the rapture we believe that god's going to take his church out seven year tribulation and then we believe in then the second coming of christ and all that but it doesn't matter your eschatology just unless you're ready like, mm. you believe that any moment, even if you don't believe in the rapture or whatever, all that, that you could die at any moment. Like, any yeah. moment, like uh, Jack Hibbs is saying, rupture or rapture. Like, <laughs> you could blow up or you could be raptured at any moment in, like, the twinkle of an eye. And so I think that if we have that, like, expectancy or just ready, I always encourage everyone to watch the movie Before the Wrath. It's like really good and it's showing the Galilean wedding and how like Jesus talked about weddings so much and how that's like a picture of him coming back for his church and his bride. And it's so beautiful, like all the things with that. But Mm -hmm. I think that if we had that expectancy not in marriage, because who knows, like I've read so many stories of like missionaries and stuff or like Gladys Elward or Corey Ten Boom and they all wanted to get married. Like Corey Ten Boom's story is my favorite. She was thinking that this guy was going to come to her house to propose to her. And he came to her house to basically tell her, hey, look, this is my fiance. And it broke her heart. Hmm. But then she said, like, I am going to, like, give everything now to serving God. And mm-hmm. then yeah. and then she's now Corey Ten Boom and all her story of, like, forgiveness and everything she mm-hmm. went through. Wow. And so I think that if we lived a life where we're not living for the promise of, because we're not guaranteed marriage. Like, yeah. when you read First Corinthians 7, it says, that singleness is a gift Mm -hmm. and those who are married have to like be concerned of what they want. But Mm -hmm. I think that if we... there's not even going to be marriage in heaven. Exactly. I was talking to, talking to a young man and he was like, I just want someone to go through this life with as it gets harder and stuff. That's why you have community. And, but we, if we think about it, it's like, yeah, we have the church and, but if you think about it, we're not even going to be married in heaven. And they're like, oh, am I just going to be up in heaven all lonely? <laughs> it's like, no. Yeah. It's like it, the relationship and everything in heaven is going to be so much better than yeah. the best marriage here on earth. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be yeah. so close. And there's going to be such a purity that we don't even need marriage. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sure like I'll be able to <laughs> recognize my wife and know, hey, yeah, we're married. <laughs> but it's going to, everything is going to surpass that. So. Yeah, I know that we've taken up a lot of your time, but um, oh, can you tell us real quick about um, it, it's called the Brook, right? Is that the name yeah. of the church? Yeah, that is. Yeah. So yeah, how is that? Absolutely. Is that um, did that start with discipleship, and now it's be- that's the church that you're talking about, right? 
That is, yeah. So yeah, so it's our it's our church. It's called the Brook, and it's it's all young professionals. So it's all twenties and thirties. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, you know, are, I'll, I'll give you like a, a minute on how we got started because it's very unconventional. Mm-hmm. But uh, we actually launched on Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. So we were, it was like March of 2020, which you know, if y'all remember was right when COVID ha- yeah. happened and when it hit and kind of shut the world down, which is just a great time to start a church. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we launched on Instagram and we just uh, kind of started putting out pictures and sort of blog post type of information and stories just about um, like sort of the lifestyle of following Jesus and kind of making it attractive uh, from mm-hmm. a standpoint of having great relationships, living a great life and knowing God. And we just sort of pitched it as this idea of we are a group of young professionals who are investigating faith. Mm-hmm. And and so that was sort of like the front door of how we wanted to reach young professionals in the city of Denver, which keep in mind is a post-Christian city. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Denver is right there with Seattle, with Portland, with yeah. New York yeah. City in terms of uh, the number of people who are actually actively following Jesus. Hmm. And uh, it was just amazing to see how quickly people started latching on. And I mean, to this day, you know, we've, we've existed for about a year and a half, but I'd say 75% of our people have actually come to faith hmm. and been baptized wow. through Instagram, <laughs> which is just crazy, which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, but but it's, it's, been, it's been really awesome just to see how God has blessed that. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so anyways, when we started, we really didn't call ourselves a church just by the traditional meaning of like, you know, people think church is a building, they think it's a place with parking spots, mm-hmm. and we didn't have a building, you mm-hmm. know, we were just a collection of people. And so behind the scenes, what we were doing was we just had the three of us, the three leaders, and then as we started to sort of make disciples, was we were just actively meeting with people, we were sharing the gospel, mm-hmm. we were sharing our, our testimonies. And then once people came to faith and were baptized, we were immediately teaching them how to share their faith and how to share the gospel. Yeah. And kind of like we talked about earlier, but just shortening that timeline between when does a person come to faith and when do they actually share for the first time and helping them kind of break through that barrier. And very quickly, we started to see how the reach of the brook went beyond just, you know, kind of our little niche in Denver, but it went to Chicago. Mm-hmm. It went to San Francisco and California. It went to Seoul, South Korea. Uh, it went to New York City, uh, to Florida. And so we're, we're seeing, I think, how God is using the power of the Internet and the just mm-hmm. massive digital connectedness that we have in today's world, um, but also just using it as a means for, I think, taking the gospel of Jesus to places um, where people have never heard it. Mm-hmm. And so um, so anyways, yeah, that's that's who we are as a rook is we're just, yeah, we're a collection of young professionals who are, um, trying to make disciples who make disciples for generations to come. Mm-hmm. And our, our, our prayer is that, uh, you know, it, when, you, when you look and you study some of the, the greatest disciple-making movements that have happened throughout the world, uh, they're almost often led by people that you've never heard of. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's a lot different than I think than kind of maybe the traditional, like, church model that a lot of us grew up with and are used to. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's the famous line from John the Baptist. It's, I must become less yeah. and he must become Mm-hmm. And so that's our prayer. That's our prayers is that um, that we can train and equip uh, young professionals to share their faith and that they would take that faith and um, bring the gospel to all nations. Amen. Praise God. That's yeah. awesome. Well, do you have any closing thoughts then for our listeners or anything that you would like to give them? Any resources? <laughs> or can they, yeah. where can they find you? Not sure. stalk yeah, you, um, but just... Yeah, just. I guess Instagram is probably the best way. You can, uh, our, our Instagram handle for the brook is the, at thebrook.city. Hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I guess closing thoughts, you know, it's, I'll just say that it's it's hard to follow Jesus as a young professional, as a person who's in your 20s and in your 30s and in today's world. It, it is challenging, um, but it's so worth it. Hmm. It's so worth it. And um, yeah, I, I just, I think that, I'm so excited and I'm so encouraged to see what God is currently doing. I mean, even just talking to you guys, just to hear about another church that's focused on making disciples. Um, I think when we can get back to our roots and we can get back to, you know, what's happening in the book of Acts, that's how we're going to see this world transformed. Mm-hmm. And so um, thanks to you guys just for, for being a light and for even putting on this podcast and uh, just taking the, the message uh, of Jesus and sharing it with people. Um, super, super grateful to be here with you guys. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, Would you, you like to pray for our listeners before we end? Absolutely. It'd be great. Mm-hmm. Father, uh, thanks for this time, God, and just thanks for um, what you're doing, God. I can just see that there's just this transformation. There's just this momentum right now that is happening 
in the church and it's not just in in my state and my city god it's happening in states and places around the united states and around the world yeah. and um father I, I just i've seen throughout history time and time again how your presence has come and has moved in such a powerful tangible way god where people have come to faith where they've been baptized uh and where just the holy spirit of god has just moved and swept throughout the uh the world god and um, I believe that now is not the time to be praying timid prayers, but it's the time to be bold. Mm. And so, Father, I just I come before you humbly and I just say, do it again. Mm. Do it again, Father. Um, I pray that you would raise up a generation of uh, young people who are disciple makers, God, who are trained to, um, to uh, share their faith, to share the gospel. And I pray, God, that you would... Um, you would take these ordinary everyday leaders and that you would use these people, God, to transform the world for you. Uh, we love you, God, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you'd like to listen to us wherever you get your podcasts, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us and check out our behind the scenes on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please make sure to check out their website in the description below. Also, if you would like to support Calvary Conversations with a one-time gift or a monthly gift, you can do that in the description below by clicking on the link that says support. And also we have Brian Sumner, who's going to be coming to our church on November 14th. So that is a Sunday. He's coming to our 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service and also a special 6 p.m. service where he'll be talking about marriage and all of that. So please make sure to check that out. I'll have our website in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next week.